In addition to the degrees it confers on its graduates, Columbia College Chicago awards honorary degrees to individuals whose professional accomplishments, creative vision, and engagement with the world truly embody the college's ideals. We will award six such degrees this weekend at our commencement ceremonies. The biographies of all the honorees are printed on pages 16 and 17 of your program. I would now like to ask Dawood Bey, Professor of Photography, to introduce the distinguished individual whom we are honoring this evening. Thirty-two years ago, in early 1985, I got a phone call from a friend who lived in California at the time, telling me that a friend of hers was moving to New York and that I should look him up when he got there. The mutual friend, Carrie Mae Weems, told me that she had told him he should do the same and look me up. And so, upon his arrival in New York to begin his residency at the Studio Museum in Harlem later that year, I met Kara James Marshall. The ensuing years have indeed richly rewarded my knowing him. Marshall's insistence that diligence, research, and the consistent practice of intentional craft could yield something of artistic consequence has never wavered from the moment I met him. From the outset, he set a trajectory for himself that was as inspired as it was singular in its ambition. Having been inspired by the great artists whose works he saw in various museums as a young person, he was also challenged by the absence of both black artists and black subjects within the museum and within the construct of art history that follows alongside that. A history that insists if it isn't in the art history books or on the walls of the great encyclopedic museums, it's probably not important. Marshall was determined to become the very thing that he was not seeing, that was absent from his early museum experiences. Through sheer unrelenting and brilliant, hard, 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 hard work over the past three decades, Carol James Marshall has indeed forged a place for himself within that history, doing his part to make the black presence a more notable one on the walls of museums, while making work that continues to raise the bar for the made art object. In doing so, he has forged the path and a place at the table, not only for himself, but for a generation of younger black artists who no longer have to explain their consistent use of the black subject in their own work. As Marshall has made it clear that the black presence can be both subject and signifier for a wide range of thematic, narrative, and conceptual ideas. The wide recognition of his work is a clear testimony to what he has been able to accomplish, having earned him many prestigious awards throughout his career including fellowships from the MacArthur Foundation, the National Endowment for the Arts, Lewis Comfort Tiffany Foundation, and the Herb Alpert Award. 
In 2013, he was named to President Barack Obama's Committee on the Arts and the Humanities. His work is held in collections at the Museum of Modern Art, the Metropolitan Museum of Art, the Art Institute of Chicago, the National Gallery of Art, Washington, D.C., Los Angeles County Museum of Art, San Francisco Museum of Art, the Whitney Museum of American Art, and the Museum of Contemporary Art Chicago, among many other institutions. And his work has been exhibited also in museums worldwide. His recent 35-year retrospective exhibition, Mastery, that began here in his hometown of Chicago at the Museum of Contemporary Art, then traveled to the Metropolitan Museum of Art and concluded in Los Angeles, his former hometown, where so much began for him at the Museum of Contemporary Art, Los Angeles, provided rich evidence of just how much he has accomplished as an artist over the course of his career. He continues to live here in Chicago with his wife, the actress, Cheryl and Bruce, and the city is markedly better for his continued presence here. I'm deeply pleased to see him so honored today by the institution where I've taught for the past 20 years. Dr. Kim, it gives me great pleasure to present Carrie James Marshall to receive the degree Doctor of Arts. Carrie James Marshall, by the authority vested in me by the Board of Trustees, I confer upon you the degree of Doctor of Arts, honoris causa, with all of the rights, privileges, and responsibilities pertaining thereto. Congratulations. This kind of thing brings a tear to my eye. I mean, for a minute there, I thought I was at the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. <laughs> the way the band was lighting the place up. <laughs> oh, well, thank you, Daoud, uh, for such a wonderful introduction, uh, for such a long and meaningful friendship and to my wife, Cheryl and Bruce, who's sitting up in the balcony up there, uh, because of whom I am in Chicago in the first place. Uh, she is a native Chicagoan. I was born in Birmingham, Alabama. I spent most of my life in Los Angeles and met Cheryl, the first person I met when I got to New York City, as a matter of fact. Um, of course, having no idea that I would end up in Chicago, but, for, but somehow being in Chicago seemed destined for me. Um, not just because I met Cheryl, and probably, probably I was destined to meet Cheryl, but because one of my greatest mentors was born in Chicago, who I met in Los Angeles. His name was Charles White. And in everything that I tried to do, in most of my life and in most of my career, I was trying to do everything like Charles White did it. I was trying to be like Charles White. And so being in Chicago is the fulfillment of a part of what it meant to be like Charles White. And there's one really uncanny experience I had that I think really sort of cements that reality. So I... <clears throat> I was fortunate enough to receive a MacArthur Foundation Fellowship, 
also known as a Genius Award, but it doesn't really apply that way to me. Uh, but what I used the, the, the resources that were given to me for was to try and set, establish a foundation for myself. And I bought a building to use as my studio on the south side of Chicago. Uh, that building had been a roofing company owned by the Tall Mayor family. And the Tall, Fair, Tall Mayor family was one of the first black-owned businesses in Chicago in, at, around the turn of the century, in the 20s and 30s. When I bought that building, all of the, the material and apparatus they had used in the, in the company was still there. And in the office space for that, uh, of that building, there was a desk. And when I opened the drawer to the desk in that office, there was a book sitting right on top. That book was a book called Great Negroes, Past and Present. And that was the book where I first saw an item about Charles White when I was in fifth grade while I was in school in Los Angeles. I mean, it just seemed so uncanny that that book would be the first thing that I found in a first building that I bought that was gonna be my studio in the place where the person who was my greatest mentor had been born and come from. And so since then, everything that has happened to me that was good has been because of things that I did while I was in Chicago. And so I have been blessed to have a partner who brought me here to share my experiences with, and I am doubly blessed to be recognized by Columbia College with this honorary degree. So thank you again. So now we're gonna get down to business. I have to make my commencement remarks. And of course, to keep me within the time frame allotted to me, I had to write this out ahead of time. Uh, <clears throat> so, uh, in the preface to a book on secrecy in African art, the philosopher Kwame Anthony Appiah writes this phrase, or this paragraph. He says, we who go to galleries and museums have been trained to attend to the most astonishing range of things as artworks. Anything presented in the right place and above all with the right authorizing narrative frameworks can be attended to in this way. By contrast, he goes on to say that if you had no story to read these objects and performances with, the same acts and things would be mere trash, worthless, hardly worth stopping for. Yet some objects catch, our, catch and hold our eye without these surrounding stories before we know who made them or why or what the meanings they have. The objects themselves address us through our visual experience of them. They demand to be looked at. So I assume it is the ability to transform these non-art things into art things, or trash into treasure, or even to invent things out of no thing that you all came to school, <clears throat> to college and to school, uh, looking for the ability to do. And so I sincerely hope uh, that all of you who are graduating today uh, found what you came looking for. Now, for somebody who decided in 1978 that I had had enough of schooling after I got my BFA, it seems a little odd to be standing here dressed as I am for this ceremony. Uh, since I graduated, I've had to put this robe and hat on more times than I imagined I would have. Uh, it's a little baggy. <laughs> Not exactly my style, <laughs> but I kind of like what it signifies. And what it signifies is that I have made it. I am Carrie James Marshall, Doctor of Art. The imperative now is to uphold the honor 
and to make sure the title doctor and the sheepskin they would give me are not merely crackerjack prizes. <laughs> so I, I do want to thank you to whoever it was who nominated me, to the committee that voted to extend the invitation for me to accept this recognition, and thank you again to Columbia College for conferring this honorary degree upon me. Now, as is often the case with graduation remarks, speakers announce that they will be conveying some good news, followed, as you might guess, by some bad news. And since I am a bit of a traditionalist, I won't be setting any new trends here, but will instead follow established precedent. The good news is that I have recently returned from a trip to Berlin, Germany, where I spent the afternoon and an evening with some art students and professors at the Universität der Kunst, which is the leading art school in the city. As a result, I am happy to report to you that all is quiet on the Eastern Front. <laughs> Whatever you might be doing, and I have no idea what that is since I haven't seen any of your work, but you can be assured that you will face little resistance and no real competition from your graduating counterparts across the Atlantic. <laughs> and, and here's why. <laughs> So during a show and tell critique session, I had an encounter with a student who had told me he had first uh, wanted to study sociology, but failed the entrance exam. And looking around for something easier, he signed up for the art school, which had no test. And they let him in. They gave him money besides. Uh, during the conversation, reacting to something I said, and I don't remember exactly what it was, his professor chimed in to his defense saying, well, whether they make anything or not is their choice. It's not my responsibility to force them to do work. <laughs> well, <laughs> given how feeble the work under consideration was, my reply could only have been, yeah, and neither am I obligated to give one minute of my attention to some BS that if encountered outside a classroom would be passed out without, passed by without even a sideways glance. Now, as you might expect, that comment didn't go over so well among the assembled mob, but I've been battle tested and I'm used to operating in hostile situations. So I managed to get out of there in one piece, a little afraid, because cold critiques in the main are a rather brutal affair. Also a little dizzy, because at this school, they still allow students to smoke indoors, and shockingly, even in the classroom with almost no regard for their fellow classmates. So the whole scene stuck, struck me as some sort of subterranean bohemian art den held over from the old Weimar days, <laughs> but extremely sophomoric and not just a little pretentious. <laughs> so it is good to be back here in Chicago, the city that really works. <laughs> not because you are forced to, but because it's just what you do and to an, an academy where integrity is what we measure when judging the output of students and professional artists alike. Now, I have a model I'll share with you for, the, for times like this. It's a model that keeps me focused on the goals I set for myself in an art world that is flush with cash, driven by hype, and intoxicated on self-regard. So the motto is, take nothing for granted. Expect nothing from nobody. 
I find these useful phrases to live by because the first principle of psychological good health is that your well-being cannot depend on somebody else modifying their behavior in order for you to fulfill your desires. It seems to me that once you accept that reality, that you have to create the opportunities you want to enjoy, success then is all about process and commitment. Now the questions become how much work is too much work to do to get what you want out of life? How much time is too much time to put in and how much money is too much money to spend getting the education that supports the confidence you'll need to compete in any arena, alongside anybody, anywhere in the world. And now for the bad news. At least since 1968, it looks like any amount of money over $4.95 would be too much to pay. And any period of study longer than 52 weeks exactly would definitely be too long a stint to spend in any programmed school setting. I guess you can consider this part of the talk a reality check of sorts. Now, I know it's never been a really good idea to bring props for a graduation speech, but my sense of duty to you, and especially to your parents, many of whom forked over thousands of dollars to cover the cost of this certificate you're about to receive, <laughs> compels me to share with you something that I have found. And here it is. Learn art in one year. Now, this book, Learn Art in One Year, <clears throat> by Robert Girard, was first published in 1965. The copy I uncovered is from a unique thrift store on Halstead Street at 31st. It's a revised edition from 1968, and I think I paid about 99 cents for it. The price tag on the book shows that it was originally for sale at a Crocs and Brentano's bookstore which was a really good bookstore that was on Wabash Avenue in the Loop when I first got to Chicago. Now, this book was offered then at $4.95. It was subsequently marked down to $2.98. Now, as far as I'm concerned, at any price, this book is a spectacular bargain. Not since the Rosetta Stone cracked the hieroglyphic code of ancient Egypt has the key to one of the greatest mysteries perplexing humankind been so universally available. <laughs> and in this book, it is the true secret of art. Now, to put this in context and to help you understand just how momentous and how monumental this find was, I'm gonna to quote to you a passage from an interview in Art in America magazine uh, on the nature of learning between, that was held between two of America's most distinguished scholars, John Berger and the cultural critic Henry Louis Gates Jr., also known as Skip Gates. Now, Dr. Gates lays out the fundamental concept embodied in universities for higher learning saying that their existence affirms the belief that the ideas and practices addressed therein are not only knowable, but they are teachable as well. Now, this book is proof of that concept, but transmits its knowledge at a fraction of the cost of a four or six year degree. Now, if you doubt the veracity of my declaration, just take a good look at me. I stand here as living testament to the fact that reading books like this outside of class that were not assigned and continuing to do so even after graduation is a habit worth forming and it pays. 
Uh, I confess to being addicted to information from unofficial sources. And by unofficial, I don't mean Fox News. <laughs> by information, I don't only mean inane tweets, goofy Snapchats, or casual Google searches. Now, for the longest time, my favorite art magazine was Scientific American. As a consequence of that, I still don't see much difference between doing art and doing particle physics. <laughs> Useful knowledge is like a drug. It gets you high. But like any unsanctioned street-level stimuli, it needs to be tested for contamination and other dangerous taints. Now, for you all, having successfully completed your school's program requirements, you're about to join the ranks of the unappreciated. <laughs> because few people outside of your family or your art school really care about what you will do. You, don't get to, you won't get a pass for good intentions anymore. In the real world, execution is everything. What we're all dealing with is ideas at this point, and ideas can have consequences, the ones you intend and the ones that are unintended. So don't take the opportunity to engage responsibly with the culture at large lightly. Now, every year in Art in America magazine, they publish a guide to artists, museums, galleries, and schools. In a previous issue, I counted more than 30,000 registered artists in that magazine. And there are all kinds of artists out there who made that list. Standing out in a crowded field like that will require some heavy lifting. Sustaining viability long enough to have a good and productive life from your art happens if you are strategic in how you capitalize on your skills and manage windfalls that come in the form of grants and prizes and honoraria. Everybody here knows about the one-hit wonders. Everybody knows about flashes in the pan. And I trust and hope that that's not the kind of plan you have for yourself. But like Mr. Gerard, I'm pushing principles here because a strong foundation really does matter. And if you don't believe that, just listen to how Henry Matisse expressed his concern about the way people misunderstood his work in a letter to the uh, curator at the Philadelphia Art Museum, Henry Clifford, on the occasion of his 1948 retrospective. In the letter he writes, I have always tried to hide my own efforts and wished my work to have the lightness and joyousness of springtime, which never lets anyone suspect the labors that it has cost. So I'm afraid that young people seeing in my work only the apparent facility and negligence in drawing will use this as an excuse for dispensing with certain efforts which I believe are necessary. I fear that young artists are avoiding the slow and painful preparation which is necessary for the education of any contemporary artist. When we don't know how to prepare, doing work that bears little resemblance to the final result, we will have a short future before us indeed. Or when artists who have arrived no longer feel the necessity of getting back to fundamentals they begin to go round in circles, repeating themselves until, they are, until by the very repetition, their curiosity and creativity are extinguished. To be clear, neither Matisse nor Mr. Girard are guaranteeing miracles if you follow their plan. Of course, the subtitle of his book is that how non-artists in 52 discipline weekly lessons can become proficient or at least fully appreciative. What he does provide is a map and a method. And that method has served me well, as I'm sure it has served many other 
artists well. I'm just sorry that I wasn't able to bring this message to you before you started your journey, as opposed to at the end of it. So now for you, as it is for all of us, it is time to get busy. The road ahead is open. It is paved with magnificent examples of mastery and sophistication. If you read the signs correctly along your way, you can get exactly where you want to go. But remember, it is always the case that knowing is better than believing. Experimentation involves risk, but the search for truth is a lifelong pursuit. And when encountered and embraced is the greatest reward for an effort honestly made. And so congratulations to you all for graduating. Thank you, Columbia, for conveying this degree upon me. And thank you all for hearing me. Thank you. Thank you.